Hi, BookTube. This is Peg at the History Show, along with my uh, fellow BookTubers and friends, um, John David. Say hi, John. Hi. And, <laughs> and Sharon Goforth. Hi, Sharon. Hi there. Yay. We are going to be doing today a little BookTube Buddy Reads chat. We recently finished um, reading a book together, and we've been seeing, well, I know I've been seeing, and I think you guys have too, that other the folks on BookTube are starting to have discussions together, which I think is a really fun part of BookTube. And I just want to continue that trend and see if we can get more people getting on these Zoom chats and talking to one another. Because um, it's just fun. I just love being able to talk with you guys rather than just reading in isolation. So um, this is our inaugural, uh, I just, Buddy Reads chat. Well, if we rename it later, great. But uh, today we're going to talk about the American Mind by Henry Still Cominger. And then I'm going to kick it over to John, and he's going to tell us all about who Mr. Cominger was. So, uh, Henry Still Cominger, we're going to be talking about this book, by the way. It is um, The American Mind, an interpretation of American thought and character since the 1880s. And it's not up until current day, it's through about 1920 or so. Um, Henry Steele Commager was uh, a famous American historian, uh, very prolific, wrote over 40 books, and led a, a pretty long life. He lived to be 95 years old. He's, uh, he's usually known as uh, someone who took up a, even though when we read the book today, we may not necessarily think of it as liberal in the contemporary sense of the word, he was known as a proponent of, of uh, modern liberalism um, in American historiography. He spent um, almost his entire career uh, in the classroom. He taught at New York University, Columbia University, and then spent uh, most of his career at Amherst. Uh, he taught for 62 years um, at all three of those schools and, and died in 1998 at the age of 95. Uh, this book that we're going to be talking about today was published in 1950. So <clears throat> there are just certain things to keep in mind. We're sort of, you know, right at, right at the beginning of the Cold War. Um, that he, it, these are terms that he doesn't really explicitly use because they're not really in modern parlance yet. But they are interesting to just sort of think about as he's choosing the things to talk about uh, during the book. Okay. Um, should we should we actually uh, jump into how much we love chapter one? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think our audience would love yeah, let's, that. Let's talk about that. <laughs> I want to give Sharon uh, give Sharon the floor on that one. <laughs> so, so so okay. so I'll, I'll share my experience with chapter one. Uh, I read it and I was I. I, I was, my first impression was this book has not aged very well. Um, it, it very much shows, shows its time and, and shows its wear in its first chapter. I mean, it, things did get better, but it has this sort of, at least to me, this like um, nationalistic bent, like America as this, and I mean, I, I'm willing to admit that America is, is, is unique in a number of ways. But it, it, he comes just short of saying that America is, you know, Jesus was on the founding father's left shoulder when they were signing that constitution, you know? I mean, it, he, and, and was, right shoulder, he, was, he was just <laughs> ordaining the founding of this country, which, you know, apparently about 25% of the American population actually believes. So, I mean, hey, who, who am I to say that's not the case? But, um, <laughs> But yeah, other impressions of chapter one? Well, do you really want to hear what I thought? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> it's, Let her rip. I found it to be, it's, it's whitewashed. It's nationalistic, capitalistic overview of the beginnings of the US. Um, and it's complete and utter BS. <laughs> Woo! That's, that's <laughs> I it. love it. That's, that's it in a nutshell. You can always <laughs> count on Sharon to, to just throw this book across the room when 
I was reading, which you, which you both know, you both know my reaction to this book. I hadn't even gotten through the first couple of pages and I was, I was ready to hang it up. Now that said, once I got through chapter one, you know, and did my hate read of it, um, then it, I calmed down a little bit and it, I was able to get through the rest of it <laughs> until the end. But, um, but yeah, I, it just, it just really, it was, it was just really, really bad. Um, he, his, his description, I, I think where I have the biggest problem with him is the fact that he never really comes out and says any of this, but it's in the way it's worded. His view is that America is white. That's who the Americans male. are. That's who he's talking to. That's who he's talking about. Is they're white males. That's it. There's no mention and, and, of very and middle to upper class. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not <laughs> until he gets into the later chapters that he starts talking about the working class slightly. Um, but even then it's not, you know, anywhere where it where it should be. But he's very misogynistic. He's very um, nationalistic. He, it's it's just, you know. And and you you talked about him, John, spending time in the classroom. Um, when I did a little Google search on him just to find out a little bit more about him, um, it said that he and another he had a co-author with him. There was someone else involved in the writing of these books, but he wrote textbooks. His, history textbooks oh, yeah. that were used that were used in classrooms at least until like the late seventies or early eighties. And you know, you hear people talk about how horrible the textbooks were, the history textbooks were, what we were fed in school. Here's your guy, right here. You know, they, yeah. that's what he wrote. Uh, I yeah, think the and other I, and I have the sneaking impression that it was probably a lot worse than this with other writers. But, yeah, I think the other well, writer it, it could was, be. He wasn't the only one, but, you know. Yeah, I think it was Samuel Elliott Morrison, who I just, you know, I purchased a huge set on the uh, World War II, uh, history of the naval warfare in World War II. So I was I was startled to read that, that he had co-wrote a textbook yes. called The Growth of the American... Republic. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was the one. So I, I have heard. those. I found them in a library book sale the other day. <laughs> <laughs> yes I know. you're gonna rush it's, right out and read it now it's two volumes yes i have it i have it <laughs> I, I i think i think one of the weak points about chapter one is that he's trying to talk in generalities and that it gets stronger as you go into the body of the book because he actually takes up individual subjects like literature journalism mm -hmm. economics um and individual figures and individual topics Whereas when he tries to keep things general, it just gets a little too, like Sharon said, whitewashed. Yeah, I agree. I, I thought it was very subjective. Um, and I know the nature of the book is an interpretation of American thought, right? And character. I'm just not used to reading such a full-throated, um, subjective take on what he thinks the American mind is, and he, he wrote it so authoritatively, like this is what the American mind is. This is what the American character was. And, and it's like, well, that's open to a broader interpretation and a lot of disagreement, you know? Um, so I did understand while I'm reading it that this is one man's opinion, but it was, it did. It took me back to like, you know, another era that I really, frankly, just didn't want to be in. <laughs> wow. Uh, well, sh sh Sharon said that she got, that things got better for her as she went into chapter two and beyond. Peg, was the, is the same thing true for you? Yes, because he started talking about people, literature. Um, yeah. And then I was intrigued because we're talking about individuals and yeah. And his, yeah, his take on what, what they brought to uh, science, politics, law, literature, the study of history. So to me, that was intriguing. And it did give me ideas for further reading. And I think, Sharon, you had mentioned that too, like, especially in the mm -hmm. literature sections, a lot of yeah. these people never heard of before. Or yeah. I don't think any of us have heard of before. Um, the other problem that I have 
um, with this book, not just chapter one, but the book in its entirety, and you both are, know that I feel this way as well, is the fact that there are zero notes, zero. There's an index and there's a, a kind of sort of bibliography, that's it. There are no notes. He has no statistics to back up. And he even, at one point, I don't have time to go through and find out exactly where it was that I wrote it down, where he even said something about, he mentioned some kind of statistics. He just said statistics. He didn't say what they were. There's no reference to refer back to it. So where's he getting his information from? I mean, I, I, and he's supposed to be a historiographer. I would think that he would want the facts, but maybe that wasn't important to him. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, John, do you know if the, was this not something that was, you know, uh, called for back in the 1950s? If you were a prominent teacher or uh, lecturer or professor, did, were you not? Uh, I, I, think, I think this is one point that we, we talked about on Voxer. We had a Voxer group in preparation for this. Uh, anyone who happens to be watching, and at, right after we talked about chapter one, we talked about this point exactly. And I suggested, um, it, this may or may not be the case, that because it is meant more as a, a work for a, an, a popular audience, a, be, albeit a well-educated audience, but not, no, it's not a scholarly book, um, that he, he left it out perhaps for that reason. That, that a lot of people when they're reading a work of history are probably not like Sharon Pegg and me, uh, <laughs> eager to jump to the back of the book and to check sources. Um, you know, we're, we're probably, you know, uh, what, there aren't a lot of history readers out there anyway. Yeah. And the few that there are are probably just reading it for the, yeah, they're not the, the history <laughs> slash narrative aspect of the writing and not to, you know, check. Extra sources and make sure that uh, this is a, a credible yep. book. <laughs> now, now, he absolutely did because of the nature of his career. I mean, he was, he was teaching from 1930 to 1992. You don't, you don't get jobs at places like, you know, Amherst and Columbia and New York University and not publish in academic peer reviewed journals. So if you, if you go and look up, you know, books like that, articles like that, there's going to be a lot of things, but he also wrote things for um, more popular audiences as well. And that's just what I took this to be. Right. Right. Well, then we can agree to disagree. Yeah. And that's fine. Oh, I didn't even realize. Are we disagreeing somewhere? I wasn't, I I wasn't disagreeing. disagreeing. I was just offering a, a possible explanation <laughs> as to why there's, why there's no notes. Okay. I, mean, it, it, I could that be totally you. wrong. I could be totally wrong. I have no idea. But um, that's, that's just one one. Uh, one possible reason. I have. Right. The, and the, uh, maybe I should state the reason that that makes me uncomfortable is it makes me wonder just how credible he is. That's, it's a credibility issue for me. But that's okay. just me. Okay. So, so we now have unlimited necessary. minutes? Yeah, I just saw that. Hey, everybody. <laughs> they got to see that on a recording. <laughs> who, who, who did that? I didn't do it. I think Zoom. I didn't had, do it either. Someone just gave us what? some. We have a message, Sharon, that we have unlimited time on this video, so we uh, we don't have to worry about forty minutes. The I gods that... must really be enjoying our conversation. <laughs> Even though, for our viewing audience, we are trying to keep this to thirty minutes because we yes. know that your time yeah. is valuable, our sanity is valuable. This book, and maybe not so much. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. So, so as we move into the body of the book, past chapter one. Yeah. Um, what I, I don't necessarily want to go chapter by chapter because I think there's something like 20 chapters. Yeah. What what actually stood out? There's there's quite a bit about literature. There's stuff about the law towards the end of the book. How uh, changing conceptions of jurisprudence were important in um, in how we decide cases. Um, there's there's a strain all throughout the book about the importance of Darwinism uh, and how 
how it changed how we think about both science but also religious practice uh literature of course um there, there's a lot of strains to pick up and and go with if we want to talk about them so um what what was most interesting yeah sharon i know you've got a lot of notes i'd love to know <laughs> Go ahead, Peg, you go first. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> as I told you guys as we were reading it in the Voxer group that the literature sections are, you know, something that I need to work on as far as, I haven't read a lot of these things in these books that he was talking about or these authors. So I kind of was looking more towards you guys because I know you've read a lot more of the classics or, you know, quote unquote classics. Um, so I, I think literature would be a good, great topic to, to start it on. And um, if you guys, I'd, I'd look to you for that part, but. Yeah, I, I'm looking through through my notes here and I noticed he, he has, he uses some interesting terminology that I don't know is used today to kind of, I'm, I, and this is my assumption and John, you can certainly feel free to correct me if, if you think I'm mistaken, um, in how he refers to different time periods. Of, of literature as it relates to his, the time periods that he's discussing. The, you know, 19th century, mostly with the literature, he starts like post-Civil War. Um, 19th century literature, and then they move into, um, you know, turn of the century, in, the eight, in that chapter on the 1890s, um, and then that literature, and then you move more into the, what we would consider like the modern uh, literature. And he gives them interesting, interesting names. Uh, like he talks about determinism in literature, and then he talks about, um, trying to find my, my notes here. Yeah, he has determinant, he had, chapter six was determinism in literature, then seven was the cult of the irrational. That, I love that chapter name. I thought that was great. Uh, that's where he's talking about, um, that's what his dis description of modernists. Um, and he's pretty dismissive of them um, as he's calling them irrational. Um, and then uh, he goes kind of said what, or kind of goes backwards a little bit. Then he, he talks about the um, traditionalists and that would be, he, puts Edith Wharton and Willa Cather and uh, is it Dorothy uh, Canfield um, yeah. kind of in that box where they're transitioning between the 19th century and the 20th century. Um, but I thought he, he had a really good discussion on William Dean Howells and I wasn't really, John, I know you're, you can speak more to Howells than, than I can, um, but it made me want to, to read him. Um, I think it's going to be very interesting to read. And then he gets into the, the populace a little bit, and that's Frank Norris and Hamlin Garland, who was another author I was completely unfamiliar with. But John, I think you have um, at least some some familiarity with him. Very little. Um, yeah, I've, read, I've read a couple of his short stories. Right. I'm, well, that's more than I have. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah. More, than, more than me as well. Um, yeah, and, and he's, he's just talking about um, one author that I noticed he did not mention, at least in this context and in that transitional period, and that I think would be really important, is Upton Sinclair. Um, you know, he wrote, uh, was it The Jungle? And I, I think that was published about 1906. And um, mm -hmm. I think that fits right in with his... Um, talk on um the the determinists um and how they were trying to get they were getting away from this pastoral uh, regional kind of literature that was popular after the civil war and then they're getting more into because all the social issues and everything that was coming up um you know the issues with with poverty and with um uh labor and uh just all the social stuff going on um, that's what some Theodore Dreiser and um, Frank Norris and I think Upton Sinclair would fit in there as well but I didn't really see where he mentioned him much um, there's there's one um, one paragraph on page 141 it's this the first paragraph of, of chapter 8 where he kind of um, he, he does a short little 
Um, I'll, I'll just read it. And it, he, he okay. sort of describes those classes of novelists you were talking about and does a little potted description of what makes them a traditionalist versus uh, an irrationalist. The naturalists, mm -hmm. London, Crane, yeah. Morris, Reiser, even Cabell, did their most important work between the 90s and the close of the First World War. The, the primitivists and irrationalists, Anderson, Hemingway, Faulkner, Caldwell, Pound, and Jeffers belong clearly, clearly to the troubled decades between the two world wars, as do those more substantial mm -hmm. novelists whose significance is to be read largely in a reaction to the dislocations of the new era. Fitzgerald, Dos Passos, Steinbeck, and Wolf. The first group reflects philosophically the mood of doubt that succeeded the earlier Victorian optimism and the impact of naturalism and of determinism. The second mirrors the disillusionment that came after the Wilsonian crusade and Republican normalcy, and the flight from reason that was inspired by the final collapse of Newtonian physics, the triumph of Freudian psychology, and the political disintegration of the old world. Both were deeply felt, deep, both were deeply affected by the economic malaise that furnished the background to so much of American history from the early 90s to the 1930s. So that, that paragraph has a lot, and it, it, it sort of goes on in the next paragraph to even mm -hmm. describe, uh, to describe the traditionalists as well. But um, yeah. I, did, did, did you get anything of like where he was going with the whole, um, what, why he felt the need to create a typology of writers? Like this, this writer reacted to these changes in this way and this one reacted in this way and well, that, I think that, I, I think he was like talking about literature. I I think he's he was trying to maybe give an give like an overview of of what you know representation. He's talking about these periods and then how literature was affected, and then he's he's using these authors as examples, um, and. Of, of these different types of literature and 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 then their their effects but um so what do you think john um i don't know i i just i have a hard time talking about uh writers as you know saying willa cather you know or uh, let let me take someone whose whose work i know a little bit better um I, I don't know, pick anyone who's written 10 or 20 novels and then just using their yeah. last name to evoke the entirety of their work and say, this is how they handle this or this is how they handle that. Again, it's, it's, it's kind of whitewashing and it's generalizing. And, you know, yeah. I, when, when I read books, no matter who, who they're by, I, I like to think about them as, you know, they're, they're all a, a product of a particular mind and time and place, but I, I like to to respect their individuality as much as I can. Yeah, I think he gets into Howells a little bit more because he talks about the change in Howells, how he started out as as this, you know, this kind of a regional and, you know, the, like, the, it's not the traditionalist, but, and I'm getting my names all mixed up, but he moves over into um, the naturalist view because he just got he couldn't put up with it anymore um right. he writes more about Howells than than he does some of these other authors and i think um i i liked what he wrote about Howells. actually i mean i he made him interesting enough to where i'm i would like to read uh some of his books and i think it'd be interesting to get you know that broad uh, perspective of starting at the beginning and reading some of his early works and then progressing on through and seeing how he changed but he quoted him some in there um in that book and i would have to do some searching in my notes to find i wrote it down but um where he just was tired he he couldn't write like that anymore he was talking he was quoting Howells, um is that he couldn't write that way anymore and he just had to show things for the way they were yeah, I, I think if you go back and, and you look at the chronology of Howells' novels, they become um, noticeably more concerned with with economic realities as he goes later in yeah. later on in life, yeah. and, and, and 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 in a very negative way. Like it's he's critical mm -hmm. of what's happening. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. 
And would you guys say that, because I picked up on that ch chapter on William Dean Howells, that and maybe, I think it, there's a, a thread going throughout this book of how capitalism impacts these different areas of society. He talks about like the writers in terms of how they reacted to the growth of capitalism or the, the excesses of capitalism, the corruption. I mean, he, it seems like he really, that was one of Commager's kind of, you know, big themes. Yeah. It was it, or is that just me? Did you pick up on that too, nope. Sharon? Yep. Okay. I think, yeah. I think that was definitely a common thread. Yeah. And I, and, and not how it just pops up in, in literature, but he also, you know, he, he looks at Thorstein Veblen too, and how he sort of reconfigures the way old, old economists looked at capitalism and said, well, you know, Veblen comes along, this is later in the book, of course, when Veblen gets his own chapter and says that, you know, America and, and maybe even Europe, it's no longer uh, a society of capitalism that is to just sustain itself this is a capitalism that has grown into something gaudy it, and it's grown into something that we are just making money to show other people that we make money that money has no final ends or final uses like to provide shelter to provide food to provide care it is just uh, pieces of paper that we like to show our friends and family to show that we have it you know, um, and that it's 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 a it's during this thirty or forty year period that that transition, which happens to coincide with the Gilded Age, right, which yeah. is really corrupt and probably yeah. pro probably no um, no uh, that that that's not a coincidence that that change happens. Right. So. So that's what you're talking about, like with the rise of conspicuous consumption, that. That's why they call it the Gilded Age, along with the the corruption. But does he does he ever really answer why that that why that came about? You know. Well, well, he, he talks I about he he talks uh, um, about William Graham Sumner and uh, and Fisk. Um, oh goodness, what what's the guy's name? He talks about with with um, Sumner. Uh, Ward, Lester Ward. Mm -hmm. Remember that, uh, I'll tell you which chapter it is. It's yeah. uh, Ward and the Science of Society, which is chapter 10. Um, so, so he compares these ideas of, uh, um, uh, of Sumner, of Charles Graham Sumner, and he has this sort of laissez-faire attitude towards law and society. And he thinks that society is just the state is there to basically to just so kind of like wind up the clock to provide you with um, basic, you know, like a military, you know, the, the very, very fundamentals of, of what a society would need and everything else you're on your own for. Society should not provide, um, you know, anything in the way of like labor restrictions, business um, regulations, anything like, because it's restrictions on freedom. Mm. And, and that's, that's he's like, sort of like the, the prototypical, like kind of libertarian, but it's, it's not just economic or anything. It's just like everything. Okay. And Lester Ward um, is, is interesting because he comes along and he says that, well, the, the state, when it makes regulations and when it makes laws, may have some some people's best interests at heart you know some of these laws some of these regulations might actual might, might actually come out being for the better of society um and 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 sumner who actually has a book of essays in the uh uh the liberty fund i don't know if you saw that pig no but, i have not uh, i um uh, <laughs> Go, go search his name in the catalog. I, I, it was one of the books I ended up buying. Um, he, he, that, that's, that's one of the conversations that's taken up in that chapter. And <laughs> the, the prevalent attitude during the time really comes down on the side of Sumner. Um, and so that, that lack of regulation, of course, leads to a lack of oversight, which makes sense. 
So if you don't have as much oversight in the legislative and legal and political sphere, you have a lot more corruption. Corruption. Okay, I see what you're saying. Um, Thank at you least for, that, yeah. those, are, those are the connections that I sort of made. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure it's necessarily the case that if you have, you know, a more libertarian society that you have more corruption, but yeah. that's, that's what I took from it. Excellent. Thank you. Sharon, you got any other thoughts on any of that? Uh, <laughs> nope. <laughs> <laughs> I do okay. <laughs> well, I'm going to throw a, a, just a few random things that I really jumped out at me. And I know there's something else I think we could all talk about later. because I think we touched on it in our boxer group. But one of the things that jumped out at me, along with the focus on capitalism and how he thought it, in, you know, infiltrated, but I mean, how it impacted different aspects of society, how people reacted. Um, in literature, in you know, politics, law, and all that, was this chapter on William James and philosophy. I thought was which fantastic. I loved. It was fantastic. It was fantastic, and it was all about. And tell me if you agree with Commager. I think I think maybe I do. But uh, he says Americans and their philosophy is all about pragmatism. Yes, it's like that word just runs throughout this book in different different ways. But mm -hmm. the philosophy of pragmatism that William James um, pretty much formulated. If it works, it's true. Yes, yes. If it works, it's true. That's, <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's an American thing, it seems to yeah. me. And mm -hmm. that's what James was all about. Yeah. Yeah, I really enjoyed that chapter. Sharon, thought, do, you, do you like, I thought you liked the transcendentalist. Sorry about that, John. Didn't mean to cut no, you no, no. I, I thought, I, I, wanted, I wanted to just add one thing really quick that I thought if there was one go-to chapter that you would keep this book maybe as a reference work for, a reference text, that it was, it was the chapter on William James. Mm -hmm. If you ever needed to look up anything, you know, uh, you needed a short 20 page price seat on William James or what pragmatism was, that was, that was a great excuse to keep the book around. Great. Um, I it's interesting because I actually I'm interested by both transcendentalists and the pragmatists. So and and how they kind of went, you know, from one to the other. And I thought he did a, a good job in explaining that. Um, just this flow of of the different, you know, the change in in thought. Um, so, but but I I am not well versed in any philosophy <laughs> it's just an area of interest of mine so i don't feel qualified to expound on it more than that but i i enjoyed the the chapter on pragmatism i thought that was um really good i'm kind of surprised john that he didn't mention charles pierce more than that than he did um yeah. i thought pierce was, was highly involved in the uh, pragmatism movement as well. Peirce was what even came a little bit earlier than James, but he was, I, I think he became much more famous as a logician and a mathematician. Um, oh. where, where, where James really comes out of the gate straight with a, a philosophy that's much more um, suited for pragmatism, which is just like everyday concerns, how we think about things like religion and, you know, democracy, um, and uh, questions that will keep um, coming up in pragmatists all the way down to John Dewey and even Richard Rorty. Um, but a purse, purse is uh, more known, I think, for, for being a logician. Um, oh, okay. Uh, but, but, but he still very much is a pragmatist. He's just not Not, not as, I, I don't even think his name is mentioned in the book, is it? Well, that's, that's, no, I think he mentioned him once, maybe. Okay. Um, maybe once. And, but I was, and it, that's what reminded me that he didn't talk about him. Yeah. But there's a lot of things that he does, that he leaves, uh, that I feel he leaves out of this book. Yeah. And that's just one among many. Um, 
the you know anyone interested in a, in a history of pragmatism should go and read um, the Metaphysical Club right away. Um, if Peg, if you haven't, read I have that. it on it as an ebook. <laughs> um, is that nonfiction? Is that history or? It's just it's a history of ideas. Yeah. Okay. Uh, great. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll I'll tell you about it later. It's it's okay. it's it's uh, William James. It's I don't know how much purse is in there again for kind of the same reason, but it's Oliver Wendell Holmes mm -hmm. Jr. and Senior. Um, it's um, how um, how their lives were affected by the Civil War and how they all Fabulous. sort of coalesce mm -hmm. around these conclusions that form the the base of what we think of pragmatism as being is like an idea is as useful or an idea is as true as it is useful. An idea is true if it works, if it produ produces results. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which on, on definition alone, I, I don't disagree with, you know? Yeah. I mean, it works. <laughs> All American baby. No. <laughs> 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 Just kidding. <laughs> so, um, so th th there was there was another thing I was um, that kept popping up um, even towards the beginning of the book. I was noticing it. It was it was this theme of I think I used the word disillusionment or disillusion. Oh. Um, you know, it, at around 1870, 1880, you have this this sort of surety, you have this picture of our place in the universe um, that we're rather, you know, confident in and sure of. And over the next 30, 40 to 50 years, we see things just start to wear away. Darwin sinks into our minds more and more. And we think, well, maybe we weren't, maybe we're just the pro, maybe we're just, the latest product in one continuously long line of biological evolution. And then you have this idea of, 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 of capitalism, uh, of it falling apart in certain ways and becoming um, crazy and, and unregulated. And, um, and, so, and also because of that, so many people having um, lower, um, standards of living um and and just the the, the it seems like like modernism which is kind of where he takes the the book up until the very brink of you know around like right around world war one is where he where he breaks off the book 1920 or so like modernism is a is a reaction to everything that he's talking about you know, modernism is supposed to be some big, some big break, right, with the past. And it seems like the, like he's discussing a lot of the reasons for why modernism chooses to, to break with the past. Why, well, what was the quote, what was the quote from Virginia Woolf sometime around December of 1910, the world changed forever? Or something like that, and she was talking mm -hmm. about the onset of, of modernism. But um, there, there, I got a sense of like things unraveling, mm. of, of things getting getting worse and more uncertain and less less sure, and uh, and th there being a sense of like social ang and cultural anxiety setting in. Yeah, I think I had used the word. Did that, was that, did that pop out at anyone else? Yeah, I called it entropy, I think, in our Voxer group. That, that okay. It seemed like he was um, charting out a breakdown of, from the founding, and, and he just starts charting how things just started to, like you said, a great unraveling. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't really a hopeful or positive <laughs> take on things or... Um, rather than looking at things like, wow, well, we have new, uh, a new school of art or uh, literature, it was, it was dismissive, I think, you know, of a lot of things. Um, dismissive of, uh, to, to, to go to a point that Sharon made earlier, 
he sounded kind of dismissive of the like he, the he called it the psychological school. I think that was just the uh, cult of irrationality, Sharon. Mm -hmm. um, that was one of my notes. He called it what it came to be known as the psychological school. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. Yeah, and he had a, a very it's strong. It's head. Yeah. yeah. He had a strong I mean, reaction to that's, that. You know, because that's where you get stream of consciousness, and that that became you know the way you're talking about Virginia Woolf. Of course, she she was was big on that. Um, and all those authors were writing that way and began writing that way. And it was all, you know, it was no longer physical or external. It was all in their heads, what was going on in their minds and, and, and just, just a way of, you know, um, a way of, of thinking about things and all. It was just, you were actually getting inside their heads instead of looking at external things instead of looking at plot there was no plot plot was your your head um mm -hmm. that's that kind of thing and and i think that kind of goes along with what you're talking about um this you know and all and he he i got the impression when i was reading over this that he was not a fan in any yeah. way shape or form of, yeah. of the modernist uh, and that's why he calls it illogical or irrational. I'm sorry, irrational. Um, and then at the know. same time, he seems to have <clears throat> this quasi Whiggish view of at least American history where he, he sounds like he has confidence in the American project. Yeah. So I mean, <laughs> it, it, it is, I mean, especially if you go back and you look at chapter one, I mean, that's certainly a conclusion you could get from, oh. from rereading chapter one, right? But then you, you, you yeah. contrast that with all of this dissolution and unraveling, and it's, it's kind of an interesting paradox to think about. Yeah. Well, and, and one thing along with that, you know, when he's talking about um, the irrationals, he's also talking about expatriates. Um, these a lot of those authors went to Europe. Hemingway, uh, of course, Virginia Woolf was from Europe, and you know there were a number of those authors that that actually went over there and they left they left the U.S. So I wonder if he's associating that stream of consciousness and that type of writing with people who have left the United States for whatever reason. That's a good point. That's interesting too. Yeah. Um, I'd like to touch on the, uh, the chapter on religion, just because religion, religious thought and practice, I think it was chapter nine. Um, I found that, I think as the only, uh, maybe the only religious person in this group. <laughs> so I'm like the, the counter. <laughs> let me know if I'm uh, talking out of place, but I don't think I am. Um, I thought it was very interesting some of the things he pointed out, I personally think still exist um, with regards to American like religious thought and practice. Uh, some of my notes, um, I love this from page 162. He said, uh, there was like a unanimity with which Americans profess a religious faith, mostly Calvinistic, and the indifference they displayed to its doctrines. <laughs> which he tied in with Americans just, we're just so sunny. We're so optimistic. Gosh darn it, everything around us, we're, we're just so, we have like showers of gold falling from heaven. We are blessed. And, um, you know, it was uh, just one of those wonderful things where I was like, oh, yeah, that is absolutely how people in America tend to think sometimes, especially when it comes to religion. It's like, I should always be blessed. I should always have pennies from heaven, you know? And, but you know, I don't care about the doctrines. I really don't need to practice it so much as just do the surface stuff, you know, which is show up to church and then, but don't walk the, the walk, just talk the talk, you know? So that, that ch whole chapter was like, yeah, I, I can see where that is definitely ingrained uh, in a lot of, of, of the religious you know, people in America who claim to be religious. Um, that whole strain of, of religion, of, of the superficiality of, 
of the ways in which people take it up sometimes is really explored in in the book by Hofstetter that we were talking about on Voxer, the um, um, anti-intellectualism in the American tradition, oh, whatever that yeah. book is called. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know if, um, I think, uh, Sharon, you said you had a copy of it. Yes, I had it. We, we, should, we should read it sometime. It takes... Yeah, yeah we should read this one next and uh, do another <laughs> chat. Oh, that's I, I, Hofstetter, I think, is, 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 is a better writer and he's and it's 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 none of this sort of um you know raw 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 america stuff either so i think we might all have a better reaction um towards what he's doing i i, I made it about uh, uh halfway through the book or so about 20 years ago when i tried to read it in college um but and i didn't stop reading it because i didn't enjoy it um i just got distracted I really loved what i read though but I would, I would love to restart it with you two. Yeah, we, we definitely should. Um, because, uh, well, this was another part that I really, I really appreciated. When he said in late 19th and early 20th centuries, religion prospered while theology went bankrupt. And I was like, yes, yes, and more yes. Um, and he just talked about how really there was never a major American religious philosopher or thinker that we produced. And I just don't know if you guys- Yeah, except like Jonathan Edwards. I mean, you have to go back to the 18th century. You do, yeah, he mentions word. Edwards, yeah. yeah. But since then, he's like, no. Yeah. Because it's all, of, and this reminds me of like what they call in Christian circles, the prosperity gospel. It really divides, <laughs> it divides a lot of Christians because either you're watching the Joel Osteen thing and you know, you can be rich and it's just like, this is not <laughs> like, I'm in the other camp where, you know, you know, my pastor is just gets like angry. Like this is not what the Bible teaches. Didn't Jesus tell us to give away all of our money? Well, I mean, that, I, I, well, <laughs> I mean, yeah. and I don't mean all, but I mean, he, he, he certainly didn't say to accrue it in a conspicuous way. Oh, so, right? it's just, Yes, but I think it ties in with that American personality or that character that he's commenters talks about, which is it's wound up in optimism. We're so, you know, and we're all about business, you know, mm -hmm. and, but so it's like when you try to marry that to religion and a belief in God, and then you try to take it out to the, to the public like that and say, Hey, you know, it's all about making money and it's uh, you know, how rich you are shows how blessed you are. And that is heresy to me. I'm just gonna say that right now. How rich you are shows how what you are? How, how blessed, blessed you are. Oh, blessed, okay. Yeah, blessed. that's why this whole, I cannot stand these. Then you need to give your money to me. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yeah, these people are scoundrels. Guys, I I'm really sorry, need but... that seventh jet. I really, really need that seventh jet. Well, there's, I... it's, they're spiritual charlatans and they're playing on people's you know hopes and you know just economic insecurities um and it's just like again it's like religion prospers but theology dies and it's like that's what we need to focus on you know it's like this life you're not actually supposed to have a good time sorry sorry america <laughs> I hate to break it to you, you know, in my faith tradition, it's about serving others and you're going to suffer, um, but God loves you and we'll get you through this and pretty much is a very nutshell type of thing, but you're not, you're not here to, to reap millions without giving back and then following doctrine, you know, so it's, it's the superficiality of American religion. It's very shallow, yes. but I find that really just, I can understand why people look at religion and say, hell no, <laughs> I'm not going there. I, you know, I get I, it. I used to work in a church. I worked in a church for eight years and, oh. and that turned me off completely. Yeah. But you know, where you were talking about Peg, where um, he talks about how, you know, they act one way Monday through Saturday. And then Sunday they, they go to church or whatever. And some people I found it, I thought it was really funny. We had people who belonged to, 
to the church where I worked who would show up twice a year. And we called them C and C and E's. Yeah, we called Christmas that too. And, <laughs> yeah. You know, they thought they were they were up upstanding church members, you know. Yeah. And that, that would take care of all their obligation, church obligations for the year. Yeah. Uh, but that's that's that same mentality, is what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I can't stand it either. It gets it gets me riled up, as you can tell. Yeah, but but it but I did. I left the church because of my experience, what I saw working in it. It was really really bad. So, sorry that happened. That is well. I and I think there is there, there's. Uh, how are we doing on time? You know what? I don't see my timer. Let's just we'll just we'll just continue until we wrap it up. Okay, well, I think I think we started sometime around six twenty or twenty five, so. Um, okay, we're about uh, so, forty five well, minutes then. My, my, my time, at least. You can uh, just edit me out, Meg. That's fine. Nah, we're not. <laughs> we're in three different time zones to make things more interesting. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, there, there, there's this one concept. Um, it's by Eric Vogelin. Who, he mentioned it in the New Science of Politics back in the early 50s. And it's this phrase that uh, William F. Buckley Jr. became well known for in the uh, show Firing Line and other places. It's called Immunitizing the Eschaton. Oh, yeah. Which just means making, making earthly or making um, material what we used to think of as heavenly or otherworldly or divine and that that kind of uh is a theme that that pops up over and over again i mean um you know before darwin we used to think of ourselves as a as a unique product of god after darwin many people think of human beings as uh one kind of of biological creation oh and i i especially thought of this in in terms of, let's see, what's the chapter called? The Evolution of American Law, chapter 17, okay. where he talks about how a lot of, um, you know, uh, 17th and 18th century European law, like Blackstone, um, Blackstone's writings on law, his commentaries on law, mm -hmm. were all based largely on assumptions about natural law like something is right or wrong because it is a, is it is in accordance with god's nature um and how changing ideas of jurisprudence during this time period that we're talking about came to see law as much more context dependent and how how things can't be absolutely wrong or right in all contexts, but it really that depends on what's going on around, you know, the economics of the situation, or you know, the other things about what surrounded the actual act that's in question. You know, so mm -hmm. um, uh, and that that kind of um, I, I don't know what. Let's see, who, who is he talking? He's he's largely talking about Oliver Wendell Holmes. Here, do you remember the discussions about Oliver Wendell Holmes when he's talking about, um, does, does he use the, the term pragmatism again? Um, he's, he's talking about how, you know, how natural law is not sufficient to, to rest jurisprudence on because we're not, that's just, it, it's not, it's not, um, it's, it's not something useful. It's not something that, that that he thought was brought anything to the table, but would you I, I don't consider... know how much anyone got anything about out of the law section. But I'm fascinated by the history of like law and jurisprudence and all of that stuff. So well, I, 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 like I see what you're saying, and I'm kind of I'm looking back at it now, and I realize that I might need to reread that just because there's a lot of there's a lot of ideas and content in here that I. I think at first pass, I think I need to to check that out a little bit more because when it comes to natural law, though, wouldn't you say that you would need to 
to base some type of truth on object, objective truth or man-made law? Well, that's what natural subjective. law says. Yeah. Yeah. I don't just totally disagree with that. So I might be yeah. in the minority. Well, I mean, there, 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 there's, there's two poles there. And I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that, you know, um, that if, if you're... <laughs> I'm not sure that, uh, you know, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes is exactly on the polar opposite end, but he's saying that, you know, there are some times uh, in which, you know, um, ideas about natural law don't, aren't as helpful as we used to think maybe they were. But that what, one of the problems with the book is that it is, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, a gish gallop. Has anyone ever heard that term before? A gish gallop? No, what is that? It's it's like when you're talking okay. to someone and they just they they're like they they give out just tons and tons of information, you know, um, in, in trying to support their point, and then you're like, wait, 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 but they keep going. Yes. This is that book. That, you know? that is a wonderful way to describe it. That is it, how I felt reading this book. <laughs> Nope, she's so back. I want like uh, it kicked me out. <laughs> just, just, just when you were thinking about, you know, you wanted to read a whole book about literature, he's like, "Here's economics." And just <laughs> when you were finished reading about economics, he's like, "Here's law," you know. Um, <laughs> and it's it's very it's fast and it's it's it. There's all tons and tons of ideas in here. I mean, if you blink you miss something important. Absolutely. And, I mean, and, and you, you can't be blamed for not picking up on stuff you're not interested in in the first place. But in case you are interested in it, there's there's stuff there if you want to go back. Well, I think I think you're right that this would be useful. This book would be useful as a uh, just to have on the shelf. And if you're doing a research or a study on, you know, philosophy one time, you're like, oh, there was that William James chapter in here. Let me go check that out. Or uh, oh, you know, I want to learn more about the, the, you know, determinism school of writing, you know, whatever. I mean, like you said, there's great chapters in here, but I think you'd have to take it a chapter at a time based on your interest at the time. Yeah. Because this was almost over. Well, it was, it was overwhelming for me. Uh, <laughs> you just, yeah. It's like well, a like, survey like Sharon, of everything. Like Sharon said with notes, you know, and with, <laughs> had, had this thing had a, you know, a, been treated with the annotated, the uh, um, you know bibliography that it really deserved. Yeah. It would have an eighty-page bibliography at the end mm -hmm. because he talks about so many things, and so sometimes he gives no more than a sentence or maybe a paragraph to something that you could spend a small book discussing. Mm -hmm. So this is true. Yeah, I agree with that. Yep. What do you think uh, about wrapping things up? Yeah, we're gonna wrap things up. I I wanted to see if you guys had anything to say on uh, the sad figure of Mr. Henry Adams. I know we talked about him a little bit. <laughs> oh, he was you a know, sad figure. <laughs> I just it, it, I just got two volumes of his uh, history. Wow. The the one on um, it was yeah. what Madison and uh, Jefferson. Yeah. Yeah. So I, think I we got talked those about reading those together and too. I got, um, hang on, this book, I don't know oh, if you can see. I have that. I have look. that too, yeah. Woo! Maybe we yeah. should buddy read that. <laughs> I know. The biography of, of Henry Adams, plus I have yeah. the other two books, the, um, the, one on, the one with the French words that I can't pronounce, and uh, which I think is kind of his spin on religion, I guess or oh. Mont, Mount, Mount something. Oh, it's, oh uh, Malchart. Yeah, Malchart. <laughs> I, I see, I, I don't speak it, it's, so. um, <laughs> it's, it. um, he, he, he goes to France and it's, it's um, basically a discussion of, of, of his, his impressions of like, uh, of Catholicism and in, in the, the the french gothic cathedrals like malchard and uh, notre dame see, I, check no, that I'm out. interested in the cathedral part of that yeah uh, 
not maybe not so much his his points on on Catholicism, but it, who knows if he's a good writer, you know. He is. Um, yeah. He's got and, a... and I just think he sounds like a fascinating a fascinating person. Um, and then there's uh, Brooks Adams, who I had never heard of until I read this book. Um, and it's interesting, I am currently reading, and, and I'm assuming, Peg, that all this is going to get edited out, um, because this is just me talking to you two. <laughs> oh, but okay. I'm currently reading a book on um, the history of blues music. And, and it's something about, it's Negro music in, in a white world, basically. Um, and Brooks Adams is mentioned twice in oh. that book. And it's like, I would never have known who that was had I not read this book. Mm -hmm. And then the other, the other person that um, he, the commenter mentions briefly and with very little respect, I thought, is, uh, is Hearn. Oh. And it's, oh. I can never pronounce his name, it's Lafcadio. Lafcadio Hearn. Yeah. yeah. And um, he's also in this, in this um, blues book. He mentions him because apparently he translated, I don't know how he would have known to do this, but he translated African songs wow. into, into English. Hmm. And it's like, hmm, wonder when he did all that because he was, uh, you know, but again, it's like, I wouldn't have been familiar with him had I not read this book. And he keeps, his name keeps popping up. So it's interesting. And plus he lived in Cincinnati for 10 years. He was, he was a, a, a journalist there and an editor, I think, of what probably the news, it's not in print, it's not anymore, but it might've been like the forerunner of the Cincinnati Enquirer. Um, and that was another interesting chapter in this book was his his spin on journalists and boy he's not very uh, happy with Hearst and, and Pulitzer. Boy, yeah. he kind of yes. raced up with the coals. <laughs> yeah, I yeah that's something. That's one of the things we didn't even get a chance to talk about. I know. Yeah. Well, because there's so much in this book. Just I know. Yeah. For yeah. Anyone watching, <laughs> this book is filled to the brim with food. <laughs> he name drops so much, and like you were saying, Sharon, I think that's the you know. There were some good things about this book, and I think it, it goes to what you said. There's a lot of things I didn't know or people I wasn't aware of that this book brought to mind. It gave me more ideas for further reading, for sure. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, overall, I, maybe a C plus. <laughs> I gave yeah, it, I... for what it's worth, I gave it three stars, and that's because Goodreads does not allow for half stars. I would have given it a two and a half stars. Yeah, I gave it so, a three as well. Yeah. The the half star was for all the information that I picked up on these people that I want to read further. <laughs> Absolutely. So. Absolutely. But yeah, we've got some ideas. I think I gave it four. I probably would have leaned more towards three and a half, but um, I I tried to to ease up on him because he he didn't have the last 70 years of history for to look back on so i i tried to to forgive him for a few things that, uh, that he said but um it was it was tough but i enjoyed it just enough to give it a four nice well done all right well what do you guys think did we uh covered all all points pretty much well not all points but most of them I think so. The ones that excited us the most, yeah. The ones that excited <laughs> us, got us riled up. Um, <laughs> Our blood pressure up. <laughs> yes. Well, I hope we can do this again soon. I know that we're going to have to settle on our next buddy read. We obviously have Hofstetter in the, waiting in the wings. <laughs> Peg, do you, uh, do you have I a know. copy of that? I do. I, do. I got the, uh, the Library of America version. It happened, oh, wonderful. It, they happened to my subscription. It mailed it to me right as we were talking about oh. it. And I was like, I, I love that. Yeah, I did. I was like, oh my God, I got it now. So we can, we can start that one whenever. Um, but for everyone watching at home, let me just, I don't know what channel you're, you're viewing this on. If you're watching on the history shelf, I really encourage you to go visit John David's channel. 
Um, I think each one of us are going to have our links to everyone else's channel. Uh, please visit uh, Sharon Goforth's channel. And Sharon, I hope this means you might, uh, you know, re rejoin us in the... Uh, <laughs> Got it. We yeah. keep going here in that direction. We keep trying to, because Sharon was one of my favorite channels, and uh, you took a little break there. So we hope you come back. Um, we hope this was a uh, fun for I'm you. Like, I might. Okay, great. So, but I just encourage everyone to go and visit John and Sharon's channel, um, and subscribe, and just check out their backlog of fantastic videos. And uh, I think we'll do this again, though. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, it's great. great. All right. Well. Okay, right. you guys in about a month or so. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, well, bye, BookTube. We'll okay. talk soon. Take care, bye -bye. everyone. Bye. bye.